Now then this morning I chat with you about the price tag attached to entering the King's College, the School of the Spirit. Now, in this connection, I want to turn now to Isaiah chapter 30 and verse 18. Uh, the other evening, as you recall, most of you, I would assume, I did speak also on the School of the Spirit and mentioned, as I had done on a number of occasions when coming to New Zealand, to Auckland, that is, I had made reference to the need of learning to wait in the presence of the Lord. Now, some one of you wrote me a letter and uh, had made reference in the letter to a personal experience of the Lord awakening him during the night and yet him not knowing what to do, what it was for, assuming that it was for prayer. Well, very often it is not for prayer at all. Now, I'm going to go into this a little bit and remember also what I said. You see, I repeat some things purposely. We, that's how we learn. Uh, uh, I try to speak, or I do speak, that's my work, to give help to individuals so that things that are said in the Lord will help some people, more or less, all of them, some in particular in the audience who have personal problems, situations, feelings of God they cannot understand. And I like to give light in, in those areas. Of course, I do not know what bothers you or what problems you have, but the Lord does. Now, with this waiting, say the Lord, let's say, the Lord awakens you during the night. Now, he might do that in a number of different ways. One of them might simply be a sense of his presence so strong within you or about you that it breaks your sleep and you have an awareness of the presence of God. You might simply have what I call an inner glow a spirit of worship could be a spirit of prayer, could be a combination. Now, when I was teaching in school yet, we had a president who uh, really loved the Lord, and uh, he was, he was all right. But he was very legalistic. And we had a pre-chapel prayer meeting, the faculty did. And one day he said, I want every one of the teachers to pray audibly, first one, then the next, all around the circle. I want everyone to pray audibly. Well, I didn't. And he wanted to know why I didn't. I said, Brother, usually when I come over to school, I get a presence of inner worship and in the session and when I get that I must not pray audibly for if I pray audibly under that condition I tear up the inner presence I destroy the thing I cannot tell you why I can only tell you what's happened and he said to me, quite, uh, oh, how shall I, almost nasty. Oh, I suppose. Well, the man obviously didn't know what I was talking about. But believe you me, folks, when, especially when the Lord awakens you, and there are other times when you are awake, and you have that inner glow of his presence, 
very, very often that is not for prayer at all. It may sometimes, but very often it is not. It is an inner presence, a new spirit, a, a worship, a hunger, a thirst, an adoration, an admiration that you simply let go up to the Lord, you direct the toward him, there is an inner praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, Jesus. You just let that thing go up unto the Lord, and out of it will come, will very likely come, something that the Lord wants to do for us that we have never even thought of. I related in this church up at the at the regular church one year, in fact I did it twice. Uh, when the Lord had sent me to Europe, I'm not repeating it now, only making reference to one angle so you will understand. And in Germany, the Spirit spoke to me in words, not audible words though, the words like stood before me. I didn't see them to look at, yet they, I discerned them before me. Peculiar how the Lord does that. There were these words. Go to Amsterdam on New Year's Day about the middle of the afternoon by air. And those of you that remember it, might remember, I protested, I didn't want to go, I finally went. And then some of you might remember how uh, I sat on the plane, the British European Airways flight to London, and they didn't take off because of a fog. We went back to the, uh, to the uh, room there where they gathered the passengers that were waiting for a flight. And I got a great spirit of worship, an intense worship, and intercession accompanying. And I just sat in a chair, it turned out to be by hours, and all my spirit could do was go up and, hallelujah. And not with the words, with on the inside. I never, never uttered a word to my recollection. An inner hallelujah. Hallelujah. That went on for hours. And then later the Lord brought me in contact with a Mohammedan from East Africa who had been praying for years, oh God, if there is a God, show me the way to true peace. Now I sat there, I had that inner presence and the worship intercession combination that I believe had to do with what was to come. God working out the Spirit himself engaged in worship and intercession to work out an unusual thing that involved, if you remember, the angel of the Lord visiting me in that airport to bring me back into the will of God when I had lost it. You can sit there in the presence of the Lord with that inner presence simply directing it to him. Spoken or unspoken, that could go on for an hour, that could go on for two, could go on for less. It gradually might subside. Well, it will sooner or later and vanish. Well, then what? Go back to bed and have another snooze. Now then, that brings me to a scripture in Isaiah 30. Uh, in verse 18. And therefore will the Lord wait that he may be gracious unto you, and therefore will he be exalted, that he may have mercy upon you. For the Lord is a God of judgment. Blessed are all they that wait for him. 
Now, this morning, you recall, we talked about the, the tuition, the price tag, and if you will recall, to break it down into specifics, this involved obedience, submission, confidence, determination, and assurance. Maybe I ought to refer to that and point it out that you can grasp it. In verses, uh, in verse 4 and 5, the Lord God hath opened mine ear and I was not rebellious. There you have your obedience. I gave my back to the smiters, there you have submission. In verse 7, for the Lord God will help me, there you have confidence. I have set my face like a flint, in verse 7, there you have determination. And again, I know that I shall not be ashamed, in verse 7, there you have an assurance. Now, these are essential elements, obedience, submission, confidence, determination, and assurance. And with the tuition paid, God brings us into the classroom. And this is the classroom of waiting. Not experimentation, waiting. Now again to Psalm 30, verse 18. I, I gave you the other succinctly so you can clinch it. Therefore will the Lord wait. God is a great waiter. That is to say, God can wait a long time. And the Lord is looking for waiters. That is to say, people who can wait with him, who can wait for him, and who can wait on him. There is a distinction between the three, though there is a fine line only between them. Therefore will the Lord wait, that he may be gracious unto you. Therefore Will he be exalted that he may have mercy upon you? Blessed are God, the Lord is a God of judgment. Blessed are all they that wait for him. Now look here, folks. When the Lord awakens you, or when the Lord throws you aside while you are awake, he does that also. And you go before the Lord in his presence. You might wonder, now what am I supposed to do? Well, the first thing we are supposed to do is to do nothing. And wait. You know, people just don't understand this. And there's a reason why they don't. I attended a camp meeting in the States, and they had an altar service. I went to the prayer room, and I had a wonderful, wonderful presence. Oh, the Lord was so real. And I was kneeling there, had my elbows on a little railing like, and my hands under my chin, and my spirit was a glow with the presence of God. Ooh, what a presence. The evangelist came along. He said, Brother, put your chin up. Put your hands up. And he took my hands and put them up. You'll never get anywhere looking down. I packed up and went home. <laughs> that man didn't have the least idea of what I enjoy. We don't always have to turn somersaults and rent the chairs and rock the board and carry them. Oh, people are noisy, especially in the States. Oh, they got to carry them. Come on now, everybody. Oh. 
Now turn around. Now shake hands. Now have a march. Now go around the place. Now shout. Do you wonder what those fellows are thinking at congregation is? A bunch of... Uh, bellhops or what? Oh, I get fed up with that. I had a meeting, and the people came to the altar, and I don't think it's necessary always to come to the altar. In fact, uh, the, the British say the altar service is an American invention, and they have something. Uh, there's a place for it, but I think it's all as everybody comes to the altar, something's wrong. Well, this doesn't mean that at all. We had a wonderful meeting. And people just came up my heads now. Anyone who would like to spend a little time with the Lord, you're free to come. And the open pit. And we had there a wonderful presence. Believe you me, it was such a presence, it seemed vulgar to say hallelujah. When a young pianist fellow came along and tried to rescue the meeting, or rescue God, he got behind the piano, and the first thing he did, and then they were empty up for chain for they were all up on that He killed the whole thing dead. And I asked the congregation to stand and be dismissed. He didn't rescue God, he buried him. When the Lord awakens me, he does that. Now I have that presence. I get myself comfortable. In fact, you can ask why. Down at the hotel at the South Pacific, the evening before I go to bed, I put two chairs there. And uh, in a certain way where I can sit comfortable, put my feet up, I have a cover there waiting so I can cover myself a bit if I'm chilly. Get the two pillows, get nice and comfortable, and then just sit there in the dark waiting on the Lord. The chairs are all ready when I go to bed in case he comes. Or if he doesn't come and I wake up and can't go to sleep, I may just decide now I'll just go and spend time with the Lord. And the first thing I do usually is to do nothing. Waiting on him, waiting for him, waiting with him. Look here in these words. Therefore will the Lord wait. Do you know what? God waits for you and me to wait for him. He has so few waiters. People that are willing to sit still for once and keep their mouth shut and let their spirit and heart go up to him in utter silence. Believe you me, folks, that waiting period when nothing seems to happen is the Lord's workshop in which he is doing a work within us that cannot be done in any other way. Therefore will the Lord wait that he may be gracious unto you. He will do a work of grace. You might sit there for an hour or two hours and seemingly absolutely nothing has happened but don't you believe it that thing can go on for days and weeks but sooner or later something is going to eventuate you will discover that something is indeed taking place now here I want to turn back again, as I did the other night, to Isaiah 64, 4. I want to add something to what I had given you then. 
is is a marvelous verse, you know. For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard nor perceived by the ear, neither hath the eye seen, O God, beside thee what he hath prepared for him that waiteth for him. Now I assume most of you were with me when I touched on this, but I'll just restate briefly this. Folks, God has things in store for those who will learn to wait for him in confidence, in faith, in expectation, without effort, without strength. God has things in store for them about which they would never read, which they would never hear, which they would never imagine in their hearts. You simply wouldn't think of it. And yet God has such things in store for such people. Here it is. Since the beginning of the world, men have not heard, nor perceived by the ear, neither hath the eye seen, O God, beside thee, God sees it, what he hath prepared for him that waiteth for him. Now I want to add something here. In the Hebrew it reads, Who worketh for him that hath waited for him. That's delicious. Who worketh for him that hath waited for him. In other words, as we begin to wait, God will begin to work. Now, let's assume it this way. Supposing you desire a new thing from God, a new experience. You know, most of us just go on. We have reached a certain plateau or a certain valley, a certain level, and we, we never rise above it. We're content. We have reached a certain height and are content to maintain it, but there is more. Now say God has birthed in your heart. Even as a result of this week Bible study could well be that the Lord has birthed in your heart or put into your heart a hunger. I thirst. I want to enter the school of the Spirit. I am making myself available to God as a candidate. Mm. I want a new experience from God. A new thing. You may not know what it is. It's better not defined. Uh, it's not good to dictate to God. But you have a hunger, you want more of God. Let's say you get up in the middle of the night on your own. Not to wake up, you just get up, you wake up. Whew, three o'clock, boy, I can't go back to sleep. All right, start waiting. Might as well put in time somewhere. All right. Father, I am now waiting for you to do for me a new thing. I don't know what it is, but something new. I want a new experience. Your book says what he has prepared for him that waited for him. Things are already prepared by God, but they are made available only to those that do the waiting all right, you spend a half an hour, Father, a new thing.
And you say, no more for a half an hour or an hour. But just let your heart go up with that desire once in a while to refresh your own mind, Father. I'm waiting for a new thing. I want a new experience. I want a deeper knowledge of yourself, whatever it is. Father, who is four o'clock? Oh, am I getting sleepy? Uh, Lord, I'm going to go back to bed now. And the next night, Father, I'm still waiting for the new thing. Or the next day, it doesn't have to be the night. But often that's the best time for us, depending on our circumstances. You cannot do that indifferently without something happening. You cannot carry on like that without something happening sooner or later. Blessed are all the years that wait for him. I have not seen nor ear heard neither had it entered into the heart of men wouldn't come to man's imagination what God had prepared for him that waited for him or who worked for him that had waited for him as soon as we begin God begins to work in our case and folks that thing works as surely as you are sitting here tonight and as surely as the book says it works but there are so few who do the waiting you know years ago I asked the Lord the same thing I got such a hunger I said father oh I want a new thing and I said that to the Lord for a long time I do not remember how long and I spent time waiting nothing happened but don't be fooled God's work one morning I went to church there was an utterance in tongues and when the utterance was given I knew instinctively it was for me and sure enough, nobody knew what I had been asking the Lord. The pastor came out with the interpretation. Thou hast asked for a new thing. A new thing would I do for thee. She got her all right. But it will call for humiliation. It will call for obedience. It will call for self-denial. It will call for suffering. And so it went on, a whole catalog. And when I heard that, I went into reverse. <laughs> I backed up. I said nothing anymore. Many years went by. I cannot tell you how many I do not know, but it's over 20 years that I know. When I before a new hunger came back I was long in the ministry then and I started all over again God brought it to pass and friends this works therefore will the Lord wait God waits for you and me to begin to wait and I'm telling you the truth. I'm not just talking. I've experienced this. I've practiced it. I've spent oodles and oodles of hours waiting. I've sat before the Lord a whole week in fasting and prayer. And got nothing and saw nothing and felt nothing. Everything was nothing. Death empty. Death absolutely nothing. Almost night and day. 
lay on the church floor uh, in the summer, it was, it was cold weather we had. And it was so cold. I went out to the ladies' room and gathered uh, napkins and the paper towels and what have you, and came back and put them over my back and shoved them under my coat to try and keep warm, and gathered songbooks and put the songbooks on top of my back to make a little blanket out of them. That's how I spent the night waiting. For a whole week, I went over to the house for a few hours sleep. Most of the night I was on the floor, all walking, changing position. A whole week! Had no presence. No presence. Nothing! Dead, empty, dry, brutal. But I wouldn't give up. I'd stand there like this, stand against the wall, kneel, changing positions, and eating nothing all week. Oh, but I wanted something from God. After one week, I sat near the front. Friday evening, it was 6.30. I just sat there. Still waiting for a week now. What would you do inside the week? And all of a sudden the Lord came. It came from the ceiling. At an angle, up, no, not quite like this. At an angle like that, at about that speed, it stood behind the altar railing, full size, dressed in white. I jumped up from my seat and ran up like I hurried up, knelt down in front of him. Life size, I could tell you whether his eyes were blue or brown, but that's my secret. I don't tell everything. I merely say that to let you know how distinct it was. Not something fuzzy. Clear as clear could be. Just like a person. And I knelt down before him. I shut my eyes. I put my hands over my face. And that's the way. I was right down on the carpeting. Rolled in the floor. And even though my eyes were closed, my hands covered it, and I was right smack down on the floor, I still saw him stand there, full size. He looked at me. He never said a word. But I knew what he said without saying a word. I could read it off his face. Five words. I could tell you in five words exactly what he said. But that's my secret. I've never told anyone. Worketh for him that hath waited for him. Now I would not suggest that any of you say, all right now, I'm going to go someplace for a whole week and I ask the Lord to visit me. I'll ask him to come from the ceiling and stand there. You're wasting your time. You might as well go to a restaurant and have your crumpets. You cannot tell him how he is to visit you or what he is to do for you. Except in a general way. Lord, I need a new thing. I'm hungry for you. Lord, oh, I want to enter into this school of the Spirit, the school of revelation, the school of the knowledge of the Lord. How he does that, that's up to the teacher. You present yourself. Remember what I said the other night? Make yourself available, have you? Make yourself available if you want to, before you go to bed, if you're interested. Father, I'm making myself available in case you want to do something for me. Look here, I have a scripture here, if I can find it, I think I can. 
I have my little t- uh, tug in there. I was going to use it this morning, didn't get to it. Oh yeah, uh, Psalm 17:3. <laughs> Thou hast proved mine heart. Look here, folks. It's, Thou hast visited me in the night. Hallelujah. I got the scriptural basis. Thou hast visited me in the night. You could say if you wanted to, Lord, before you go to bed, Lord, I'm not dictating to you, but I just want to tell you one thing. I sure would love a visit from you. I, but I'm only going to tell you I'm available. In case you want to pay me a visit, Lord, I'm interested. I'm available to have you wake me up or whatever you want. Father, in case you want to visit me tonight, I'll be all right. I'll be delighted. Thou hast visited me in the night season. Now, part of this blessedness we find in 1 Corinthians 2, 9 to 10. We've touched on that a little bit. I'm now adding some to it. I told you the other night, Paul is now quoting from Isaiah, and I also told you why Paul is changing Isaiah's words. I'm not repeating that. But as it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of men the things which God has prepared for them that love him. Not for those that wait him, for them that love him. For those that wait him uh, for him in love. No, no. But God has revealed them unto us by his Spirit. Now, this waiting, folks, is used here is a precondition to revelation. In verse 9, you have the waiting for him as a yearning lover, not a selfish figure. And this waiting, this spending time in his presence, is a precondition for revelation. I'm going to tell you something now. When I was with you last year, I also stayed down at the South Pacific. That's a nice place to stay. What lovely rooms. And lots of a little refrigerator you can save money by making yourself a little lunch. That's what wife and I do. We have lunch up in the room. We buy some food made out on lunch. Cut expenses, you know. I was in that hotel last year getting in real trouble physically. And I am in real trouble. I had planned to go to Sydney as soon as I got done with you Sunday night. On Monday morning, I had planned to go to Sydney to the Canterbury Oriental Hotel and spend there a week in fasting and prayer. That was part of my plan. But I was up very early that Monday morning after I finished with you. I was up very early with the Lord. 
I do not remember whether the Lord had awakened me or not, but I do remember there was quite a presence, and the Lord was dealing with me not to go to Sydney. And I had an argument with the Lord. And I told them, I've already booked a hotel, a flight is confirmed, and besides, I want to go to Sydney. I had planned to do my fasting and praying there, not in Auckland. There is one reason for it, more than one, but one of them. Nobody in Sydney would know that I'm there. I didn't let anybody know. Now, when you're in a city like this with meetings, people find out where you stay and before you know it, you have so many visitors, you can't give up with them. And I, I, can't, I can't engage in counseling. I, I, uh, I, I just can't do that along with the ministry. And then, then you, get, you get disturbed. And, oh, Brother Butler, could I? It'll only take a couple of minutes. By the time you get done, a couple of hours are gone. Those things don't take, those, those don't, things don't take a couple of minutes. And so in Sydney, I knew I would be safe from you. Well, from any, anywhere I could do that. You see what I mean? I, I, I thrive and tell you that I need to spend time with God, undisturbed, unseen, and what have you. So I knew in Sydney I'd be safe, nobody knew I'd be there. Lord dealt with me not to go. And I got almost rambunctious. I said, Lord, uh, uh, the flight's arranged, uh, the, the hotel is booked, and I'm going to Sydney. He dealt with me not to go. And ten minutes before I was to go to the airport, I finally agreed that I would stay in Auckland. And called up the airline ten minutes ahead of schedule to go to the airport. I took their bus. But I wasn't going. And they thought it was a little late, and I agreed. Well, they said, will you take our next flight? No, I said, I'll, I'll take your flight, but I do not know when I'll be going. So, they went without me. They got alone, all right. <laughs> but it wasn't very long before I got into real physical trouble. And I was in trouble, period. Now, what will I do down at the South Pacific? I called on this pastor of yours. And I said, brother, I am in trouble. And I told him my trouble, but I won't tell you. He said, I'll be down this afternoon. Well, this afternoon was a long time, but I didn't question it. I need an help. He came in the afternoon. We sat on the bed. And he said to me, Brother Butler, ever since you called, I've been looking to the Lord about you. Now, just how he did it, I do not know, but evidently he had held this thing before the Lord, whether shut himself up or went on with his other work, I do not know, but he, he, he waited for the Lord. He waited on the Lord on my behalf. And he said to me, The Lord showed me what's wrong with you. And we're going to pray. And by tomorrow morning you'll be all right. And he said a very short prayer of deliverance. And then he said, then he said, said, tomorrow you'll we'll be all right. And the next morning I was just fine. Blessed are all they that wait for him. In the first place, I had to wait down there in the hotel. And he did his waiting on my behalf in what form I do not know. Was I glad that I stayed in Auckland? On whom would I have called in Sydney? I know people there. I know preachers there. But I would not have called on one of them. 
I knew he had what it took from the Lord. Sometimes we are just too much in a hurry. Blessed are all the ye that wait for him. Now I said to you from this that uh, this waiting is a precondition to revelation. A reef, but God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. Now that's the context. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of good. Friends, waiting for God is a precondition to God taking us into the depths of the knowledge of God and the knowledge of His Spirit. The Spirit search of the truth. The deep things of good. And God will disclose these deep things concerning God to those who wait for him, who learn to sit in his presence. The crumpets can wait. Other things can wait. We wait for the Lord. I have spent hours and hours and hours sitting in naked faith, knowing that blessed are all they that wait for him. So somebody asked, what am I to do when the Lord wakes me? Should I pray? Should I shout? Should I... No. No. Just say, keep still. Let the heart go up, as I told you, in adoration, in worship, in admiration, maybe a breath of praise, heart going up. It's this attitude which principally counts with a distinct objective in mind, namely, that in some way God will share with me that blessedness that awaits those who wait for him. I dare you to try it and keep it up. So, here is the Spirit that will share with us the deep things of God. Secrets of the knowledge of God which he does not share with everyone. These things do not lie on the service. But of course there's a price tag. You remember we talked about that. Then in verses 10 to 11, they tie in with what I said. For what man in eleven knoweth the things of man save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. In other words now, to those that wait for the Lord, the spirit of God will share with them what he knows concerning God. He will disclose unto us, shall I say, the Father, the depths of the knowledge of God. And notice verse 14. But the natural man, hmm, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Now, those who are not spiritual, they consider these things absurd, ridiculous, foolish. And there'll be mockery. Oh, yes, people will mock you. They'll call you a mystic. Uh, they'll call you a cuckoo and what have you. But that's all part of the price. See, of Jesus, it is said, I hid not my face from shame and spitting. Neither care 
when he knows him, the unspiritual person is incapable of receiving these things. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. I'll tell you something. In the sitting in the presence of God, God will impart to us, will cultivate within us a spiritual discernment that we can even discern the mood of the Spirit. I'm not saying the Spirit is moody. I don't mean that. But where we can discern the mood of the Spirit, we can sense when he is grieved. We can sense when he is agitated. We can sense when he wants to teach us. We can sense that when there is an utterance in a meeting or when we should give an utterance. Through this waiting, in, his, in the awareness of his presence, our spirit becomes sensitized to the Holy Spirit, God imparting to us an increasing discernment in the things of the Spirit of God, and they can be ever, ever so sharp. We have a revival in our school. I was put in charge of leading it by the faculty. And the Lord for that revival had given me a discernment so sharp I could detect the slightest things in a meeting. Now, I do not have that today. That was specially given for that occasion because the, the revival demanded it. Uh, the, the president of the school, who was all with me, he was sitting on the platform. But the meeting got to a place where I had to discern the human spirit from the satanic spirit and the ways of the spirit and even the purposes of Satan. On one occasion I could discern a coming attack of Satan. I could discern it. And I stood behind that pulpit. I was on my tiptoes. I expected momentarily an interference by Satan. I can't tell you how all I can say is that I, I could sense that Satan was coming to do something to disturb this meeting. And I was on the alert as sharp as could be. And sure enough, one of the boys jumped to his feet and gave a false utterance. I was ready for him. I slapped that boy down with a stinging rebuke. It's ready for him. There's no mistake in the move of the Spirit when that, that was unusual. Well, the president sat on the platform, and because of this high sensitivity, I could sense, oh, how shall I put that, uh, the, the activity of his human spirit. I caught it, and he was sitting about as far away as his pastor, but to my right. But I said to the pastor, to the president, I said, after me, I said, brother, would you be so good and get off that platform and sit with the students? He said, why? I said, because the proximity of new spirits, spirit, sends me signals that interfere with my discerning things that are going on in the assembly, and it makes a problem for me. And he was the president. And he said to me, Brother Butler, I can understand that. That's perfectly all right. There he sat. Such a sharpness. But you know what? That kept waiting before the Lord every night from sharp 2.30 
until chapel time at eight o'clock. I do not know, remember whether I had breakfast or not. Well, you had to get dressed, you shaved, but uh, except the absolutely necessary things, all the time was spent in. No praying. Simply sitting in a constant awareness of his presence. The revival lasted 10 days. And every morning at 2.30 on the dot, the Lord would awaken me. And I knew it was time to get up and stay up. 30, 3.30, 4.30, 5.30, 6.30, Let's say 10 o'clock, then I'd have to go apart, get dressed and shave, get ready for school. Every night for 10 days. And during those times, the Lord would let me know what he was going to do in every single meeting, a meeting at a time. True. I would go to chapel, and i say, students... This morning is going to be wash day. The Lord was collecting our laundry. You don't understand that, do you? He was dealing with things in the hall that needed cleansing. Or I would say in a meeting, today is going to be victory day, or today is going to be this day. I had a name for every service. And the Lord would give me what to speak on. He would give me who should sing a solo. And what they should sing. I had to get the song for them or request what to sing. They were not allowed to, to choose their own. I, I, would, I would get it from the Lord and I gave it to them. The Lord even let me know what stands and not to sing. What stands to skip. Time and time again. My new even in the meeting where I was to stop and let him take over the meeting completely. And I'd sit down and he'd carry on the meeting on his own. In one place I missed the signal. I knew where I was to stop doing anything on myself. And somehow where I was to stop, I missed up and kept talking explaining to the students what the Lord was doing. And our, our dean of women stood up after a while, gave an utterance in prophecy. I'll, I'll stop soon. I'll finish this and we'll go home. And she stood up and said, Oh, that thou wouldest but keep silent. <laughs> then he would speak, but this is his say. I know who she meant. She never knew who she knew was meant. I know. And I sat down. Oh, that thou would this but keep silent. Then he would speak, but this is his day. And I sat down. Humiliated. For two hours I didn't say boo. I said, Lord, you took the meeting out of my hands. I'll not touch that meeting no matter what happens until you give it back again. He gave me the meeting back after two hours. You see, the meeting went all morning long, sometimes way into the afternoon. Uh, well, we start at eight. Usually it went till about dinner time or later, that's four hours or more. For two hours, the Lord carried on in that meeting. Marvelous. Then he gave me back the meeting and I could go on with it. And the Lord would share those things during the night. Honestly, folks, I had a complete program, so to speak, of what he was going to do. I think I had what Jesus said, talked about, the Father worker and I work hitherto. The Father let me know what he was going to do in the meeting, and all I had to do was cooperate with him to get his work done. And all during the night, from 2.30 till about 7 o'clock, just sitting, 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 waiting, waiting, waiting. On the inside, a spirit going up in communion, in worship, in adoration, in admiration.
him hour upon hour, night after night. No wonder. Now this may be, this is unusual, but I hope it inspires your heart. Remember what we read this morning? He wakened morning by morning. Speaking of this, he wakened my ear to hear us to learn it. That's what I heard. Morning by morning, night by night, to hear us to learn it, to hear us ghost of our thought. And David, thou visitest me in the night season. Therefore will the Lord wait that he may be gracious unto you. Blessed are all they that wait for him.